You don't have any no, uh, it's just happy to be here. Obviously, uh, lots of moving parts uh, in terms of the next stages of COVID-19, working really diligently with provinces and territories to make sure that we are supporting them as they manage the uh, increasing cases that we're seeing across the country. And Dr. Tam and Dr. New have spoken extensively, I think, about uh, their concerns about those, but also the number of measures that we have at the federal level to support and augment the work the provinces and territories are doing. Okay, so we'll take some questions on the phone. About for, uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. So, Operator, do we have a question on the phone? Please press star 1 at this time. If you have a question, s'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. La première question est de Émilie Bergeron, agence QMI. À vous la parole. Hi, um, Minister I do I would just like to have your comments on today's uh, Conservatives motion. Um, so it's about the Health Committee. So I just want to have your, um, to know what are your major concerns about this motion. Right. Um, well, as you know, the uh, conservative opposition motion uh, compels uh, a, a vast number of documents over a very short period of time uh, for the House of Commons to study. And, you know, it does so, I think, with, uh, with uh, a, a sort of a a lack of understanding of, uh, of uh, how focused the department is right now, not necessarily on what has happened in the past, but certainly on the kinds of activities that Canadians expect us to stay focused on. So the things that the department are working on right now, for example, is preparing for uh, vaccine rollout, making sure that we have uh, appropriate supports through uh, our rapid response program, whether it's human resources or other kinds of resources for provinces and territories, uh, working on issues around around the border, including uh, including with Alberta on a new uh, testing pilot, making sure that we have uh, equipment and resources that are coming into Canada, that are being assessed for use in Canada. And all of that work is critically important. I think, you know, uh, we've been transparent with uh, opposition members. We've been to HESA committee uh, more times than I can count. Certainly the officials are always willing to come and share information. We've produced thousands of documents for the health committee. So. Uh, I think, you know, the motion really uh, is, is uh, from my perspective, one that interferes with the ongoing functioning of, of Health Canada and PHAC in a way that actually, uh, you know, I think is not what Canadians expect. And what Canadians expect right now is for all of us to be working on what comes next and how we help them through the next waves of this pandemic. Okay, so uh, you mentioned this motion would um, interfere in, in Health Canada's capacity to do its work. Uh, that was kind of a similar um, argumentation that was used uh, by the government uh, against the motion that was defeated yesterday. So what are the chances that we're going to assist to the same um, scenario Monday as the vote is going to come on this motion uh, is it going to be um, considered as a vote of confidence? Uh, I don't make those decisions. That would be a decision uh, that would be made by uh, others. But certainly, here's what I can say. I, I think we're always willing to work with opposition parties on amending motions so that they get to the intended goal. And if the intended goal is, as the member from Calgary Nose Hill says it is, which is to have an ability to analyze what has gone well and what has gone wrong uh, in terms of Canada's response to the pandemic, then I think having a more reasonable time frame, for example, to produce documentation would be a gesture that she was sincerely interested in those goals. I think the fact that she wants those documents, uh, I will remind you, in the thousands, uh, and, and really no document is too small, uh, and she wants that within 15 days. And I would say if she's interested in understanding, you know, uh, the work of the departments, the relevant departments over the course of the last several months in a deeper way, that, uh, you know, a more reasonable motion would be an uh, indication that she truly was interested in learning about how our previous response could inform the future uh, steps that we take to protect Canadians. And Mackenzie, question in the room. Hi, Ms. Saidu. <clears throat> Mackenzie Ray with CTV News. Uh, the federal government has announced a program with Alberta today to uh, have testing at the airports. Can you just go through how that came together? Can we expect this to come in other provinces anytime soon as well? 
So, yes, first of all, I just want to thank the province of Alberta. It's a good example of collaborating with provinces and territories on uh, research projects and uh, endeavors to better understand the virus and to better understand our response to the virus. So this uh, research project uh, essentially will test uh, arrivals at the border uh, within a time frame that will allow us to better understand the nature of the length of quarantine. Y you know, we've been using a 14-day quarantine out of the principle of precaution. Essentially, 14 days is the longest period of time where someone, if they've been exposed to the virus, will become symptomatic. And of course, 14 days poses an enormous uh, challenge for people who are trying to travel uh, from country to country. And so this uh, this pilot will give us a better sense on about when we can test and have certainty that the person uh, is in fact uh, negative or free of COVID-19. Um, in terms of uh, the province of Alberta, we've been working out the details with the province for uh, some time. Uh, they've been a full participant in the design of the study because, of course, it's within their jurisdiction and they would be the responders uh, from a public health perspective uh, if, you know, if people do get ill, but also because we want to make sure that everything that we do, especially on borders, is done in partnership with provinces and territories. So as for other provinces, is there a timeline on, on similar things going to there? And as well, you kind of mentioned potentially making a change to the 14-day quarantine period. I know that is the longest. Does this mean that the government is open to lessening it to maybe 10 days or a shorter period of time in the coming future? Always open to working with other provinces on all kinds of different research. In fact, we spent almost a billion dollars so far on research in COVID-19, and much of that is uh, through partnerships with uh, provincial organizations and projects that are happening in a variety of uh, provinces. There's also another study happening with Air Canada McMaster. Um, I believe that's in Ontario. I'm not sure if it's limited to Ontario. So I think all of that research is going to be really helpful to answer part two of your question, which is what is the ideal length of quarantine and can testing at a specific time frame within that 14 days shorten the length of quarantine. As of right now, the 14-day quarantine remains, but this research is going to be extremely helpful so that we can get to the goal of having a much faster way to enter Canada. Um, also, uh, get to the goal of making sure that we don't have any importations from other countries or really keeping those low. We'll go back to the question on the phone. Uh, operator, do we have a next question? Yes, the next question, the prochaine question is from Louis Blouin de Radio Canada. Your line is open. Have you the parole? Hi, Minister. Uh, about this uh, pilot program in Alberta, when could we see it extended to maybe other provinces or all over the country? Like, what would the, the time frame look like if it's successful uh, in Alberta? It's hard to say what the time frame it will be. Uh, you know, look at the researchers are just beginning uh, their study. Um, have to check on the length of time that the study is uh, is proposed to take but we're you know we're focused on making sure that uh, we have adequate and accurate research from which to draw conclusions and at the end of the day uh, as I said I'm always willing to work and look at opportunities to partner with provinces and territories in any area of innovation or research we really do need all hands on deck to be able to challenge to, to uh, address some of these really challenging decisions in front of the country you know the border uh, restrictions and the quarantine has been a very effective tool in reducing importation, in particular the 14-day quarantine, which gives you ample time to determine if someone actually has COVID-19. But it has been a huge irritant and challenge for businesses and for travelers and for also, uh, you know, family reunification, all of the kinds of things we've talked about over the last several months. And so this is an opportunity for us as a country to understand how we blend testing with the 14-day quarantine tool, uh, how we actually reduce uh, the length of time that someone might have to stay in quarantine and begin to um, make it easier for people to travel in and out of Canada. Uh, some would wonder, uh, during the second wave like that, is it the right moment to, to test this or to go on with this experiment? Is there not a, a bigger risk right now? Well, that's why uh, it's so important to work in partnership with provinces and territories. And again, this is a research study, so there will be appropriate controls to make sure that uh, we are actually following people, understanding if they're becoming symptomatic and doing the appropriate thing of isolating them should they become symptomatic. There are no changes at the border right now, to be clear. And so this is a controlled study with a willing province who has the tools and the capacity to be able to manage the study. That's why I'm so excited about it, because it truly is a partnership with the province of Alberta, and it is an important piece of research that we absolutely need here in Canada, indeed around the world, to understand how better to manage borders during the time of a global pandemic. Question in the room, Jordan? 
Uh, good afternoon, Minister. I, I wanted to ask you, because we're talking about oversight of government decisions and accountability, but some of this has based on science and a scientific method that's always evolving. So I'm wondering if you can just describe a bit, how do you see, where, where's the balance for you about holding a government to account for its decisions, but not politicizing the science that's always evolving about this? It's such a great question, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the evolution of science. And, you know, I think that's one of the narratives that I find most distressing coming from the opposition is that somehow, because advice changed at some point, that the government was hiding information or that the government was giving misinformation, and nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, all around the world, we've seen information and advice updated, guidance changed as we learned more about COVID-19. And so it's very important that we support the researchers and scientists who are doing, by the way, a phenomenal uh, amount of work and a phenomenal job, actually, of ad adapting and adjusting to new information as it comes forward. The other thing that I think is quite... Um, um, I think quite dis d distressing to hear from, uh, in particular, the Conservatives, is a diminishing of a global response. You know, today in the House of Commons, I was um, questioned by a member, uh, a, a member from from the opposition, the Conservative opposition, about our efforts to help contain the virus in China. And you know, you may recall that we sent expired personal protective equipment uh, early on in the pandemic. This is an actual public health principle that you try to contain the infection at the source using every tool possible so that it doesn't actually spread. In this case, the world wasn't successful, but we owed it to Canadians to be part of an international response to try and contain that infection at its source. And I think, for me, the problem with all of that is it is actually the misinformation that sort of, you know, the misinformation that we see propagating on the internet is often based on these kinds of allegations that somehow, because advice has changed, that scientists have not been upfront. In fact, science is a series of post Posing hypotheses and then proving them either correct or incorrect, as most people who have taken grade nine or grade 10 science will remember. And so it's really, really important that we, uh, you know, have the confidence of Canadians that we bring them along with us. And we do that by making sure that as the evidence uh, changes, we also respect that evidence and research and the researchers that are giving it to us. And so given that those researchers are right now working on, on a vaccine, your government has put money into that. But vaccines are not a sure thing. They're not a silver bullet. So if we don't ever get a vaccine that works, what's plan B? Well, it's such a great, another great question, and I feel like we could sit here and have a chat about this for a long time, but I think we can look at other examples of diseases that have emerged over the last 20 years or so and realize that viruses have emerged that we've had to learn to live with and that we've had to learn to control. And in fact, science has been a big part of how to do that. I'll point to the HIV virus, you know, uh, it, that emerged in sort of the late 70s, early 80s and, and, you know, became a global pandemic, in fact, killing almost 14 million people today. Date. There's still no vaccine for HIV, but what we do have is effective treatment, effective communications and education, a reduced stigma for people so that they can actually go forward and get tested and understand their status so that they can stop the transmission of HIV. Uh, there are other things that we've learned to live with, influenza being one, for example. It's not uh, obviously as lethal as COVID-19 as we know now, but it certainly is, uh, it certainly is a, a killer of many people, including seniors, every single year. And what do we do? We do have a combination of vaccines, but also education, uh, infection disease protocols, and in particular, congregate settings, long-term care homes, all of those kinds of things. And I think, you know, barring an effective vaccine, which will be, as you point out, not the silver bullet, but an important tool, uh, we'll have to work that much harder on making sure that the other tools that we develop and that we provide to Canadians can help reduce the transmission of COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. This is all the time we have.